Yallavarikum Namaskaram. It's a great uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to be asked to give this uh, M.K. Prasad endowment lecture. Professor M.K. Prasad, he was, I think, both a great thinker and an actor. And since 1979, when I first met him, but of course I had heard of his work even before that. And till recently, when he passed away, we were in constant touch and uh, we were very good friends and uh, I certainly consider him one of my gurus. Now, I would like to trace the heritage of Professor M.K. Prasad and his uh, thinking, his actions to perhaps the greatest son of India, Gautam Buddha. Now, Gautam Buddha was a rationalist and he was in favor of an equitable society, contesting the privileges of high caste, especially monopoly over knowledge, and advocated equality and peace. Uh, he was, as I said, perhaps the world's first rationalist because he explicitly states that one should believe nothing, no where you read it or who has said it, not even if Gautam Buddha himself has said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. And that is the rationality of modern science. He also was clear where knowledge comes from. Uh, when he have obtained enlightenment, there is this famous Bhumisparsha Mudra. Uh, he points at the Mother Earth, saying that all his knowledge comes not from some divine revelation, but from Mother Earth, from objective observations of this world, which is again a hallmark of modern science. Now, Indian society regretfully forgot Buddha and his teachings, and indeed expelled him. Uh, his teachings had much greater influence. Uh, they spread over Far East and Southeast Asia, and perhaps they have been responsible for some of the remarkable accomplishments in that part of the world, but we lost his heritage. Nevertheless, and, and to, to, to emphasize that we must reject Buddha, this Bhagavad Gita, which the Hindus consider one of their sacred books, was composed, uh, linguistic evidence shows, a thousand years after the original Mahabharata was composed, and 500 years after Buddha. So it was meant to counter Buddha's teaching. And uh, it, I just quote a few verses from Gita, Chatur Varnam Maya Srishtam Gunakarma Vibhagasha. I have created, Lord Krishna says, four Varnas in relation to their qualities and assigning them appropriate duties. And what are the duties? The lower Varnas must unquestionably serve the upper Varnas. It says, there is nothing as sacred as knowledge, but that knowledge is to be denied to the lower varnas. And it more explicitly says that you must have faith. Uh, you should not doubt anything. You must take everything on faith, which is of course the obverse of rationality. Fortunately, as I said, his heritage did not altogether disappear from this country. Van Bhatta, who was along with Charaka and Sushruta, the third great Ayurvedist, and uh, his Ashtangurdaya and his Rachadas, they are amongst the, along with Sushruta and Charak Samhita, the most important compositions of Ayurveda. This Van Bhatta was a Buddhist. It is very clear from his writings. He specifically pays homage to Buddha in his writings. So he was a Buddhist physician and the society, uh, the Hindu society surrounding him, it seems, drove him away from this native, it is not clear, maybe Sindh, maybe Kashmir, but then he came all the way south to Kerala. And Kerala had the old tradition of Ilwans, the Ilwans, they had one of their occupations was tapping toddy and they were in live contact obviously with nature because of this uh, involvement with topping, tapping toddy. 
but they were respected as skilled herbalists. And Vagbhata wanted to learn of the local medicinal herbs, and he acquired his understanding, which has gone into his Ashtagurdaya and such uh, compositions from the Iravas. So, unlike anywhere else in India, Iravas, although they are considered a very low caste by the Hindu society, they had the privilege of learning Sanskrit to study Vagbhata's Ayurvedic treatises, which incorporated the knowledge which he had acquired from them. And this tradition continued. One of the famous Irava physicians is Iti Achyadan. Now, uh, the classic botanical work uh, that uh, even before Linnaeus's works was Hortus Malbaricus, this botanical treatise, which was commissioned by the Dutch governor, Kuchi, I guess, and uh, it is a treatise on the flora of Malabar. And uh, it is explicitly uh, acknowledged that four local herbalists, they provided all the information which went into this treatise. And the preeminent among them was Itiachuran. He was an Irava. Next, in that tradition came Narayana Guru. He was an Irava Ayurvedic practitioner and, of course, uh, for Kerala and for all of India, a great social reformer. So because of his uh, uh, being having the privilege, unlike in other parts of India, of using the knowledge of Sanskrit to read Vagbhata works, he rejected that restriction. He read uh, extensively through all the Sanskrit texts, and he founded a school of religious worship, which was open to all castes, a school based on the notion of equality of all human beings. And one of his followers was Sahodaran Ayyappan. Now, M.K. Prasad told me that Sahodaran Ayyappan, in fact, stayed a few houses away from his own uncle's house on uh, that uh, island on which he was born and brought up. Uh, and uh, Sahodaran Ayyappan was a prominent social reformer, a thinker, and a prominent rationalist. Uh, you know, he talked of Yuktivada, the uh, importance of rationalism. And uh, uh, he was a leader of uh, reformation movements in Kerala in his time, that is, in M.K. Prasad's uncle's time. Uh, M.K. Prasad tells me that his uncle participated in one of these Mishra Bhojanams, uh, where people of all castes sat together and ate together. And uh, for that, in fact, apparently his uh, uncle, Krishna Siri, I think his name was, who was an Ayurvedist, uh, was excommunicated for a while anyway. And M.K. Prasad absorbed from Sahodaran Ayyappan his spirit of rationality, of uh, equality amongst human beings. There was another, another source of uh, his uh, enlightened thinking, and that was J.D. Bernal. J.D. Bernal uh, was a great uh, physicist, but he was the one who showed how to use crystallography to uh, find out about the structure of molecules. And uh, uh, this uh, is his model of water molecule, but uh, also biological molecules. And he really was the person who established a molecular founder of molecular biology, this very important modern discipline. But Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad, which was constituted to begin to publish, bring science to people in Kerala, it was inspired by J.D. Barda. And J.D. Bardal has this uh, edict, which is a favorite edict of mine. Science is a systematic enterprise of skepticism. So in uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Saushayatma vinashyati. Uh, those who doubt will go to perdition. You must take everything on faith. Bardal tells me, no, science is a systematic enterprise of uh, skepticism. Saushaya Meva Jayate, you must examine everything critically. And as I said, this was the other source of uh, 
rationalism uh, in uh, M.K. Prasad's thinking. So his intellectual heritage, as I was saying, is partly that coming by ultimately from Buddha, who was the world's premier rationalist, and of modern scientific enlightenment and egalitarian philosophy as represented by intellectuals like Bernal and I would like to mention J.B.S. Holday. J.D. Bernal and uh, J.B.S. Holday, they're both British scientists and both close friends. Now, J.B.S. Holday had this interesting biography that he was a British citizen, of course, but he was strongly against British imperialism. And when Britain, along with France and Israel, invaded Egypt in 1956, then he said, I have had enough of this imperialistic country. And he came to India and, and became an Indian citizen. And he uh, died an Indian citizen. So it was this holiday, like Bernal, and their uh, rationalism, as well as their rejection of uh, the imperialism, that was uh, undoubtedly part of the important intellectual heritage of M.K. Prasad. Now, he, with this, Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad had started as a scientific publishing enterprise. But uh, Prasad took uh, KSSP beyond publishing to examining social issues. Very early in his uh, active involvement in Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad, he organized a symposium on pollution because on his own island, he had native island, uh, he had seen horrible pollution affecting the local, really uh, originally beautiful nature with its mangroves and uh, uh, birds and so on. So he was very aware of this impact of pollution. As I said, he persuaded KSSP to go beyond just publishing, get involved in these social issues. As I said, he, along with Bernal, Haldane, and so on, he began to think about and question European domination of this world. And let me, it is very important for us to understand what is happening in India today. So let us look a little more at the European domination of the world. European used their mastery over science and science-based technologies of navigation and warfare to overrun the rest of the world. Now, science the, and much of the technologies originated in China. They went to Arabic world. And actually, before the enlightenment in Europe and European Renaissance beginning with 12th century, China and the Arabia, Arabic world was ahead in science, science-based technologies of Europe. Guns and rockets, uh, these are technologies which originated in China and Arabs had them. The Europeans picked them up from the Arabs. But anyway, they um, then made remarkable progresses and they developed the method of modern science. And this allowed them to very effectively harness science and technologies coming from science. And especially, of course, to dominate the world, navigation, going over the oceans and warfare was important. They used it very effectively beginning in 14th century or so to overrun the rest of the world. They seized control of natural resources of four continents, uh, North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand. Now, by either massacring the native people for example, in North America, in part, they massacred the Native Amerindians, but on plains of Argentina, for example, where it was very easy, they actually hunted like wild animals, every Amerindian of Argentina, and completely eliminated, totally massacred the local people. It was a massive genocide. Same uh, was the, ex the exercise on the Tasmanian island, which is part of Australia now. Massacred, completely eliminated the native people, or in North America, pushed the native people into a corner. 
black people they enslaved and used their cheap labor to develop prosperous cotton sugar rubber plantations and it is a uh, very interesting to note the hypocrisy the americans boast that thomas jefferson his declaration of equality of human beings is a great uh, statement about all human equality this thomas jefferson had a big plantation of course on land taken over by force from other indians and he had through his entire life as many as 600 black laborers working on his uh, cotton plantation and talking of on one side human equality he kept them as slaves he started a sexual affair with a 14 year old slave girl it is now well documented and had several children by her so this was while talking of human equality what the europeans were doing and with all these resources at their command they developed the throw away wasteful economy imposing the cost of all their resource consumption on the colonies so they created new unprecedented levels of inequalities in the world inequalities which were far greater india had of course its own share of very shameful inequalities but these were even greater than what india had developed and these inequalities were superimposed on india's already unequal society by the british when they conquered india and that has what created today's society in india where as i said uh, in the dual society where there is injustice to the people at the grassroots at levels which are unseen in any other part of the world so when british came to india all the british uh, travel logs and i have read many describe india as being an ocean of trees india's village communities had guarded despite their own internal problems of inequality the village communities had guarded and sustainably used the resources of their common lands so that india was a ocean of trees and it was teeming with wildlife now the british on their own island had actually gone ahead and developed inequalities far greater than indian society beginning as early as 1066 with the conquest of britain by william the conqueror they had begun by enclosing the village common lands britain too had the villagers had their common lands which were well managed and they were forested and uh, in general had abundant natural resources while like the aristocrats by force took away all these common lands from the people this is a famous episode known as enclosure of the commons and peasants became utterly impoverished in britain and not just in that uh, uh, impoverishment of uh, one side of way but they had been of course like all human beings hunting in their common lands for thousands of years but now the aristocrats the lords and the dukes uh, they reserved all hunting for themselves and if the peasants continued to hunt as i said they had done for maybe thousands of years then they were called poachers and what was the punishment they were hanged they were killed now even today it is interesting indians are not aware of these kind of facts but this is well documented there are these aristocratic game reserves throughout uh, england game reserves uh, controlled by again lords and dukes and others and there their hunting goes on the forests were gone and the larger wild mammals were gone but there are still wild mammals and uh, 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 smaller ones and wild birds and every day 12300 wild birds and mammals are killed in britain and britain is preaching us uh, to stop hunting all over india while this is going on in britain and as i said the elitist nature conservationists of india who have created and uh, bolstered our dual society completely unaware of these facts if i tell them these facts which are well documented they are amazed so what did british do 
they wanted to drain all of India's natural resources. So they took over village community lands without any compensation. And the device was forest department, pretending to undertake so-called scientific management, but it was nothing but confiscation. Actually, the British uh, revenue officials, seeing what was going on, themselves also protested. Uh, there, are, there are letters from, I guess, uh, some commissioner of a Madras presidency, a British commissioner, that the forest department is not conserving the resource. This is not conservation, it is confiscation. So, and that is what was done. Forest Department was created as an agency dedicated to confiscate the resources guarded by peasants and our adivasis under the guise of pretense of conservation. And they liquidated forests once having taken over, handed large tracts to European tea and coffee plantations, destroyed forests to meet huge demands of railways for sleepers and for fuel, to supply timber for wooden ships of British Navy and gun carriages. And while they were doing all this service for the wealthy and influential, they were harassing common people and extorting bribes, at the same time subsidizing the rich and the powerful. This is again very well documented. Uh, even it is going on today also. And even in our Western Ghat Ecology Expert Panel report, I have given specific concrete evidence of how FD is both subsidizing and at the same time extorting bribes from the people. So meanwhile, there were these hunting sprees. India was uh, teeming with wildlife. And Britishers went on a completely unrestrained hunt. There is this famous stone plaque. If you go to Bharatpur wetland, you will see this stone plaque. And the Lord uh, Viceroy of India, Lord Lithgow, he boasts that he has shot single-handedly 4,273 water birds on a single day. That is his great triumph. But then... British wanted Indians to, among other things, lose all self-respect. So one of the devices was the Criminal Tribes Act. It is the most inhuman of act. While British aristocrats hung the poachers in India, more systematically labeled all the communities which were undertaking hunting as a part of their traditional livelihood. They were made into criminal crafts and tribes. And there were thousands in just the Madras presidency alone. There were 237 communities that hunted as a means of subsistence. They were uh, called criminal tribes and castes. And even their just born infants were criminals. Whatever they may or may not have done. I, even their infants were subject to drastic control and punishment. I mean, you cannot imagine a more inhuman act, but this was not abolished even five years after independence. By 1952, it was finally abolished, but India's inegalitarian society, coming all this abuse of the lower ranks of the population, and they immediately created a new act which is still in force called Habitual Offenders Act. So the earlier criminal tribes are now labeled habitual offenders and they are still being uh, discriminated against. A large number of communities which were traditionally hunting were converted into criminal tribes and this uh, injustice is continuing even now with the Habitual Offenders Act. Now, one of the important actors in nature conservation in India and its elitist approach were the tea and coffee planters. They insisted that shifting cultivation must be banned. Not only should there be village common lands taken over, but shifting cultivation everywhere should be banned. Explicitly, they said, otherwise, we will never get labor supply for tea and coffee estates. People must be impoverished to come and work as laborers for us. And they considered, and there is abundant uh, evidence, there is a very nice book uh, by Paul Harris Daniel called Red Tea, of how they treated the common people of India who came there as labor with contempt and 
treated them like slaves or worse. And I met some of them uh, when I was quite young. And they told me, oh, they were gentlemen hunters. If anybody else uh, hunted, they were poachers and must be put down. But they can hunt as they wish. And of course, they hunted, as I told you, little Togo killed 4,273 ducks on a single day. He was a gentleman hunter. If the Mir Shikars caught a few birds for to make a livelihood, they were poachers and should be made into criminal crimes. Now, of these coffee tree planters, too, Ralph Morris and E. P. Gee, they were in their own right very good naturalists, but they were had this attitude towards people. And when India's first board for wildlife was constituted in 52, they were two of the members along with a few Maharajas. So that was the elitist board that decided on the policies. They endorsed forest department's confiscation and formulated Wildlife Protection Act with strong support from urban nature conservationist Eli. The forest policy of 1952, which was formulated at the same time as this wildlife board was constituted, reasserted the hegemony of forest department. They forgot all the promises Mahatma Gandhi and Congress had given during independence struggle to re-empower village communities. And in Kerala, you have this famous example of grassim, which uh, was given bamboo, mind you, at one rupee per ton. While common people had to buy bamboo at 1,500 rupees per ton, the mill exhausted the bamboo through overuse and polluted air and water with impunity, severely impacting agriculture, fisheries, human health. This was what is now called crony capitalism, squeeze the nature and the poor to fatten the rich. So what did the Wildlife Protection Act achieve earlier? Forest department strangled hold was restricted to some 23% of the forest land of the country. Now it has overtaken the whole country. The whole country is in the strangled hold of the forest department. One of their targets was Chipko activists and the one panchayats which were well managed by the Chipko people in Uttarakhand. So the vested interest in continued confiscation of resources by the Uttarakhand villagers use this act to destroy the one panchayats, sabotage the one panchayats so that accelerate, uh, deforestation and degradation of wildlife habitats was accelerated. Weakened people could not resist. And you know, amongst the uh, outcomes is the Chipko, uh, sorry, the Chamoli disaster of last uh, uh, February, where it is clear that environmentally degrading projects thrust on people are turning out to be even economically unsustainable. And all this has been achieved uh, using the Wildlife Protection Act by the Forest Department. And throughout the country, India is a tragic uh, cauldron of conflict because of the Wildlife Protection Act. This is what uh, Mr. Pabla, a very sensitive and uh, straightforward forest official of Madhya Pradesh has estimated, over a thousand people are killed by wild animals, losses of crops and property run into thousands of crores and people can do nothing because if they resist, they are criminals under the Wildlife Protection Act. So in Kerala, there is this talk about wild pigs and what to do with the wild pigs. Now, I have talked to two good friends, one of them retired head of police in Maharashtra and the other a retired high court judge from Maharashtra, both have said the Wildlife Protection Act is unconstitutional. Under Indian, Indian Penal Code, if a wrongdoer assaults you, you can even kill it. But wild pigs which assault people have occasionally killed them, regularly transport and destroy their properties. If you kill them, you are a criminal. This is simply undefendable. And all data shows that wild pigs in parts of the world are actually being culled as pests. And only in India, they are protected as a threatened species when all evidence shows that their population is exploding. And what do you have? You have the elite enjoying 
viewing wildlife, which is fine, but uh, what is the management of the uh, these areas doing? So Sarishka became a matter of dispute, and in 2005, the Prime Minister con constituted a Tiger Task Force, of which I was a member, to look into the fact that Sarishka seemed to have lost all tigers. Uh, while FD was saying there are 20 present. So the Central Bureau of Investigation stepped in. They reported that not only had the tigers been poached, but the way the carcasses were left, there was no question that forest department officials were party to all this illegal killing of tigers. But what did happen? No forest officer was called to book. Forest officers went around the villages uh, on the border of Sarishka and bet up people, as is their want. And as I said, India's nature conservation elite will applaud this beating up of the people. That, I think, is the major tragedy. So, because of this, for common people, environmental protection is coming under the stranglehold of forest department. Kerala had its own experience of this Eco-Fragile Lads Act, which has allowed Forest Department to arbitrarily take over forest improperly, and then in the process also, of course, uh, harass people and extort bribes. And after our Western Guard report was published, the same process was repeated, and the vested interests which wanted to destroy Kerala's nature used this as a way to start a campaign against the acceptance of our report. What should we do? There are very good examples in other parts of the world. By the way, no other country in the world has a, anything like India's Wildlife Protection Act. As I told you, in Britain, all these aristocratic hunting preserves, they are shooting right and left. The Americans hunt outside their own national parks. They go to Africa where there are game ranches. They pay and hunt elephants, lions, all sorts of things on game, African game ranches and bring home those trophies. It is ridiculous, uh, as I said, to manage wildlife in the way we are doing. So what should we do? We should pay. If communities want to protect, if Bishnois, for example, want to protect and their chinkaras and their wildlife, then they should be paid. Uh, Kerala, many sarpa cows are being protected and trees which are serving as the nesting site for sea eagles. Uh, if those are being protected, they should be paid. Australians do that. But the most reasonable approach is the Scandinavian countries approach. So they say that wildlife is a renewable resource and it should be put to wise use. Game meat is part of their culture, can be sold, and local communities should decide on uh, what kind of harvest to make. And of course, if uh, the wildlife damages property, you can kill it legally. But you know, wildlife abounds in Sweden. Uh, there are these moose, this big deer, abundant moose all over Sweden. And Swedish citizens uh, take a license and properly harvest them. And I have enjoyed with my good friends in Sweden, moose kebab. And moose is still thriving. And indeed, if you look at global performance, uh, Sweden, Norway, these are the countries which are at top of the world in environmental performance and in happiness indices. India is at rock bottom in both the environmental performance index and happiness index in this world. But we have, I think, hope we have, there are many reasons to think that we can go ahead. Uh, our constitution uh, declares people to be sovereign rulers of the country. We have uh, 73rd and 74th amendments to the constitution, extension of Panchayat Raj to schedule areas act, Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers' Rights Act, Biological Diversity Act, Forest Rights Act. They have all provided a framework for decentralized governance. And uh, I must say that Kerala is the one state which has maximally used this framework for decentralized governance. And people at grassroots all over the country are motivated to conserve. 
and building on models like Australia and Sweden, we can create a just and viable system of preserving nature. And that is the challenge before us. So what were MK Prasad's manifold contributions, as I said, to include this great uh, thinker and actor, he was particularly concerned with enhancing the abilities of people at grassroots to play a positive and active role in ensuring environmental protection. There was this, uh, he was part of this public education campaign to uh, halt degradation by polluting industries, to save Silent Valley. He took the lead in making a Nakula of India's first totally literate district. He had this very interesting program of involving the people in panchayat level research faculty for new literates. The people's planning campaign in Kerala, which I believe a model which we have had before our rise in the, while writing the Western Ghat report. And uh, in Ernakulam districts, uh, we had also uh, involved in preparing people's biodiversity register. So we have, I think, abundant hope to go forward because today in the new knowledge age, all knowledge is becoming accessible to people in their own languages. Google Earth images provide real-time information at the level of landscapes, biological communities. Google photo lens applications allow identification of all plants and species, even by poorly educated people. Google Translate is removing the hurdle of knowledge of English. And apps like WhatsApp and maybe platforms like Zoom, which we are using today, permit rapid, effective communication, even among totally illiterate people. And uh, oh, there is enormous information available on the World Wide Web by in, um, public encyclopedias like Wikipedia. So these are tremendous opportunities to take MK Prasad's life work forward. And I believe that that will be the fitting to do to this great thinker and actor. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you. I hope uh, that uh, you, know, you will go ahead and actually act on some of what I have tried to say. Thank you so much.